$25 for he and his wife when he accepted the Sabbath. But he began to feel convicted that he should share, like he should preach, he should share these new messages, these new truths that he had found with the Sabbath. And as he did, it seemed like his money was disappearing. He had a business. He sold sash locks, but he could not make a go of it. And the money kept disappearing. And he was not quite willing to surrender everything. Ellen White had a vision even and said, John, you should go and preach. And he couldn't quite bring himself to do it. And finally, he got down to where he had one silver three-cent piece. We used to make those here in the United States many years ago. He had a silver three-cent piece. His wife came to him one Monday morning after John had finally committed that I will go if the Lord will open the way, and then finally said, no, I'll go anyway. She came to him on Monday, and she said, I want to buy some thread and some matches. And he said, well, this is all the money we have. I'll give you the three cents. Please just buy one cent worth of matches and one cent worth of thread and bring home one cent so we're not totally broke. While he was away, while she was away shopping, there was a knock on the door and somebody came and said, I want sash locks and placed an order for $80 worth of sash locks, of which John Loughborough would make $26 as a result. There's a general conference session. We're at a general conference session and there's one I must share with you a little story about. It was 1922. The president of the General Conference at that time was Arthur Daniels. He had been president for 21 years at that point, and some of the delegates decided that it was time for a change. We need some new blood there in leadership. And so they came to San Francisco, California, where the General Conference was, session was held that year, determined that they were going to replace the General Conference president who had been in all those years. But there were others who were just as loyal, I mean, were loyal, they were just as determined that Elder Daniels would be reelected. And so it was a contentious, I guess would be a good word, it was a contentious General Conference session. Those that wanted Elder Daniels returned to office, they spoke up, and those that wanted change, they spoke up. Now, on his way to that general conference session was Elder W.A. Spicer, the secretary of the general conference from Chicago. His wife did not accompany him out to the general conference session. And so from Chicago, he wrote to his wife back in Tacoma Park. And he told his wife in this letter that I don't even want to be secretary of the general conference anymore. I've been there for 19 years. Well, he didn't tell her that. She knew it but he'd been secretary for 19 years. He said, I want to be a field secretary. I want to be out where the action is. I don't want to be stuck behind a desk. And then there is a long lapse of letters, long time span between that letter and the one he wrote from May 22 out in San Francisco. It had not been an easy general conference session. I don't know if there was ever another time in our history when this happened. But, you know, the first thing that happens at a general conference session after you get organized is you uh, set up the nominating committee. Well, it was no different in 1922. So the 1922 general conference session, the nominating committee went off to meet. And the two sides, those that wanted Daniels back in and those that wanted Daniels out, they went back and forth. And as I say, I don't know if this has ever happened another time in our session, but the nominating committee could not make up its mind what it wanted to do. So they brought the fact that they couldn't decide, they couldn't bring in a recommendation, they brought it back to the whole delegates. Everybody except an accredited delegate was ushered out of the hall, and now the two sides would add it again, those that wanted Elder Daniels and those that didn't want Elder Daniels. The two sides went at it, and the delegates could not decide what they wanted to do. Somebody must have stood, they wouldn't have had a microphone then, but stood and made a suggestion. Nominating committee, isn't the nominating committee supposed to nominate somebody? Why don't you go do your job? And the nominating committee then went off to nominate. And at this point, Elder Daniels realized that even if he got the job again, it wouldn't mean a thing. So he gave way. 
And the man who had been secretary, who did not want to be even secretary anymore, was elected president of the General Conference. If you know anything about the story of Elder Spicer, you know that he is one of the most beloved presidents in the history of our church. He was a humble man. He was a man who was totally dedicated to the Lord. And the delegates knew that if there was any one person that could bring this church back together after what they'd just been through, it was Elder Spicer. On May 22, Elder Spicer sat down and wrote a letter to his wife. I want to read just a few lines from the letter. I have a photocopy of it here. He's described all that I've just been telling you and a lot more. And then he says, I begged all to try to think of some other way. But after a season of prayer, no way seemed open and I could not refuse. I am sorry for you, dear Georgie. That was his wife, Georgie. I'm sorry for you, dear Georgie. You would not wish it for me. It is so different from the work I long to do. But I just couldn't get out of it without selfishness. Don't worry. It does not call for a superman, but just for a consecrated man doing his best. And that I will be, Georgie, dear, by God's help. Don't worry, dear Georgie. Four years, and I will have my successor ready, you may be sure. Well, in 1926, they put Elder Spicer back in. He didn't get out of office, finally, till 1930. He went on to say, So, dear sweet wife, I am just your husband that loves you and would rather have the kingdom of your heart than any office honors. Now, guys, tell me, does that sound like a man that knows he's going to be in trouble when he gets home? All right. Now the sentence. Now the sentence. I remember the first time I read this more than 40 years ago, and it's still knowing what I'm going to say next from this letter. It still hits me. There are no posts of honor, but only of service. <laughs> Elder Spicer had it right. In the cause of God, there are no posts of honor, but only of service. He goes on to say, don't tell anybody what I wrote. Well, of course, I'm reading this to how many thousands of people tonight? From now on, I must be ever more careful. I love you, my own dear heart, your W, or your Will Spicer. This concept, I had the privilege, but rich in faith. There are no posts of honor, but only of service. When we talk about walking in the footsteps of our Adventist pioneers, we have some pretty big shoes to fill. Well, I don't know if you noticed it, but uh, at the very beginning, uh, did anyone catch where, where it said how many times Dr. Merritt Kellogg sold his house in order to start the, the St. Helena Sanitarium? How many times? Five times. Sorry. I think that's just a demonstration of the dedication that began our church, and that's the type of dedication that we need to display as stewards of God today, isn't it? Well, our offering is for the Inter-American Division. Next week will be our 13th Sabbath offering. These are the um, projects for the 13th Sabbath offering. And uh, 
Then we'll uh, uh, begin a new quarter's lessons, but we'll continue with our series on stewardship today. And the title of our lesson today is The Habits of a Steward. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we uh, get ready to start. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the privilege of opening your word and of learning about you. And in the process, we also want to learn about the characteristics or habits that belong to those who follow you and who agree to be the stewards of your uh, treasure, your gospel, uh, as well as your money, your, your time that you give us, all of the things that you give us as your children. And we pray uh, for a special uh, measure of your Holy Spirit today as we study. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I like this uh, picture that uh, they put at the beginning of the lesson. Uh, it shows a workman carrying a toolbox, and the habits of a steward, I think we could say, are the tools of a Christian. So a very uh, good illustration, and of course they put a cross on the side of the toolbox just to be sure you got the message that uh, these are spiritual tools uh, that we use in our day-to-day uh, -day activities as a steward or as a Christian. Because one of the things that we've talked about this quarter has been that really the characteristics and the things that go with being a steward are really what go with being what? A, a Christian. We're talking about the same thing here, aren't we? Uh, stewardship is just a application of being a Christian as far as uh, our resources, our time, uh, our talents, and the gospel itself, but it all comes back down to our relationship with Christ. And what is the basis of our relationship with Christ? That's probably not a very clear question. To be obedient? What is the... Why do we have, why do we have a relationship with Christ? Love, but why? Pardon? To be like Christ? To worship God? Our relationship with Christ, being a Christian, that's what we're talking about when we say we're a Christian. It's not that you're a member of a church or that you uh, follow a, quotes, Christian faith. People use that term to mean that you just, that's the way you grew up. That's what your parents were, that's what you are, that's what you'll always be. It's the way you were born. But being a Christian has really nothing to do with any of those things. Instead, it has to do with being one who follows Christ. And what have we said over and over again is the reason that Christ came to this world in the first place. To tell us about God is the only... is the main and primary reason Jesus came. He came to save us, but that's even, even that is secondary to us knowing the truth about God. And I want to reemphasize that it is the truth about God that actually saves us. We get separated from God as sinners. Adam and Eve, the first thing that happened after they disobeyed God was they hid. And when God came and, and to talk to them in the evening, as he usually did, they were hiding. And that has been the case with sin ever since. And learning to trust God again is the process of salvation. And this is the process that, that Abraham went through, isn't it, in the Old Testament. Genesis uh, 5, 15, I think it is, says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So learning to trust God again is what salvation means. 
And all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they did not save people. In fact, Isaiah said, I really detest your sacrifices. He's telling, he's giving a message from God. And he says, God says, I detest your sacrifices. So why would God give the sacrifices? Because he was trying to teach people what was involved with sin, the terrible nature of sin, the, 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 uh, the malignant nature of sin. It'll kill you. And, uh, and when, they, when they sacrificed a lamb in the Old Testament, the, the lamb did not save them. God saved them. But the process was to teach them this, this lesson over and over again so that hopefully they wouldn't forget it. And uh, so the reason Jesus came to this earth was to teach us about God and bring us back to God. And when we talk about Jesus being our intercessor in heaven, that's really what we're talking about, isn't it? That has always been Christ's responsibility as a member of the Godhead has been to be the go-between, if you please, the one who bridges the gap between the infinite, all-powerful, you know, awesome, amazing creator of the universe and human beings, angels. Jesus was, had a special job in heaven before he came to this earth of being God's representative to the angels. This is what the war in heaven came about from, was Jesus... Some of the angels said, well, Jesus uh, is just one of us. Why should he be, be uh, occupy a special place within the Godhead? He had identified himself that closely with the angels in heaven before he came to earth. And what was the title Jesus had in heaven? He was the, the arch, archangel, if you please. Uh, there was, there was, uh, he was Michael. And uh, he was the first of the angels. And when Satan uh, saw that Jesus was honored as a member of the Godhead, and yet he was a, an angel, as just as he was, he became jealous. And that's where sin came in. But it was, God was trying to help the angels understand what God is like. And... After we sinned as human beings, the creation on this earth, then Jesus was promised to come to be the one to help us understand what God is like and to give us salvation. Because in heaven, it sounds like from the description in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that more than a third of the angels at first followed Satan. But many of them changed their mind and, and came back to God and were saved. And, and Satan himself was offered the opportunity to be saved as well. If you will just put aside this rebellion, this spirit of rebellion, I'll accept you back as a full member of, of the family of heaven. And Satan was too proud to do that. And that's what is our problem at times, isn't it? We become too proud of our own... Uh, of our own... Uh, Selves, whatever, whatever part of it we're in, entranced with, uh, it's usually not our own behavior because sometimes that's pretty poor, but uh, we regard ourselves more highly than we do God and we won't, we won't uh, submit to uh, being a child of God again. And that's where people are lost. Well, the habits of a steward are really just the characteristics of someone who is learning and following God. And Christ is the way for us to do that, isn't he? Uh, there, Christ is the fullest example, I guess we could say, that we can see in human form of what God is like. So the habits of a steward are really, we could say, are characteristics of whom? They're characteristics of Christ, aren't they? And uh, in your lesson, there are, I think, about five uh, 
descriptions, um, habits, if you please, and I think each one of them falls in this category. And this is the first one, seek God first. And I've just put in a couple of texts from uh, different parts of the uh, lesson uh, on this. Psalm 119, 9 and 10 is from uh, is the memory verse. And the question is asked, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? The answer is by living according to to your word, meaning God's word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And sometimes when we read this, we concentrate. Oh, I can't even find the little uh, button here. We concentrate, there it is, on the uh, uh, do not stray from your commands. And really the important part of this verse is the phrase above it, I seek you with all my heart because I don't know about you but I've learned in my own experience that sometimes no matter how hard I try to follow God's commands I fail and the secret of uh, of seeking God is uh, the secret of living with Christ and living with God is to seek God with all our heart and when there is a problem that arises when we're less than perfect in our experience with God we don't let it you know separate us from God we keep we seek keep seeking after God and uh, this is uh, this is probably uh, the most important of these five uh, habits of a steward is to seek God first And uh, verse 11 uh, from Psalm 119, he says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And what does, in practical terms, what does that mean? To hide God's word in our heart. That's a metaphor. It means it stands for something else. What is he really talking about? Commitment. How do we hide God's word? We take it into us, don't we? And uh, when, they re- when the psalmist wrote, the heart was where people made really strong choices and uh, dedication and so forth. We understand that, that really the place where all that happens is now is through physiology. It's the brain, isn't it? So... Hiding God's word in our heart means to read it, remember it, think about it, meditate on it, put it into practice. Uh, It's more than just a superficial reading, isn't it? Yes, you had your hand up back there. So no one can take it from you. That's why you hide it. Yes. So this is extremely important, what she said. This idea of hiding God's word in our minds means that God's word is, is his expression to us of his character and his uh, wishes and his thoughts. And if we're making that, bringing it into our minds, what's happening to our minds? It's becoming part of us. When we, have, when we think a thought... When we read a word, when we pray, all of this happens through electrical activity in your brain. And the more you do that electrical activity, guess what happens to that electrical pathway? It gets better. Uh, and it's, it's uh, a short, it, it, in, a, in essence, it's like it's a shorter distance from part A to part B. Uh, it just it can become automatic and that's what it means to hide God's word in our 
in our heart, but really it's our brain that we're talking about, isn't it? So uh, this is, uh, I, I think we could spend the rest of the time just on this habit, and this pretty much encompasses everything else uh, in, a, in a way, doesn't it? Because if we want to know God better, if I want to know you better, how do I go about it? I talk to you, I spend time with you, uh, maybe I eat meals with you, I go on a walk, I get to know you as a person, and that is the way that we get to know God better as well. We talk with him through prayer, through studying his word, and, uh, and, and as we pray, we have one other thing we can do, and what is that? Yes. To be more like him. What else? There's, there's one thing I'm thinking of specifically. A request we can make of God that he will always answer. We can ask for his spirit to come into our minds. And if we ask that, if we make that request, it is a guaranteed yes answer. So, uh, these are all part of this habit of seeking God first. You can see that the more you involve yourself with God, habits are what we were just talking about. They're those electrical pathways in your brain. And the, the deeper and the stronger, however we could say it, those pathways become, the more automatic they become. And that's when we develop a habit. So seeking God first means if you're starting a sanitarium like Elder Dr. Kellogg did, you would be willing to sell your house five times in order to get it going. And it would be a natural thing. It would not be something you would have to wrestle with yourself to do. Uh, it's something that needs to be done. I will do it because of my relationship with God. Ephesians 5.15, he says, Be careful to live wisely, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And that really is what we're talking about with this idea of seeking God first, is we're wanting to understand the Lord's will. And the Lord's will, of course, is that we would prosper and be in health. And you can think of all kinds of other things that we read in God's word that God wants for us. And the more we want that, the more we want what God wants, the better off we are, aren't we? So let's go on to uh, some of these other uh, uh, and then, he, and then uh, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So whatever you do for work, remember God is really your boss. And the, the boss at work is just the one who tells you what to do to earn money. But God is the one who tells you what to do uh, and really... Your relationship, our relationship with God actually becomes part of everything we do, doesn't it? And if it is something that we only do here on Sabbath morning, it's a very weak, sick relationship. Sickly, maybe is the word I want to use. A, a puny, pitiful relationship. If all we do with God is come and worship on Sabbath morning. So seeking God first is the first. And then the second one that they uh, listed was looking for the return of Jesus. And this is a uh, little parable that Jesus told his disciples in Luke 12. Uh, he said, be dressed, ready for service, keep your lamps burning like servants, waiting for their master to return from wedding banquet. And Matthew talks about the, the ten wise or the, the five wise and the five foolish young women at a banquet. 
at a wedding feast. And uh, they were, the ones who were wise had the Holy Spirit even before they needed it. And the ones who were foolish didn't, their relationship with the, with the bride and the wedding, the bridegroom and the wedding was not so important. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's what that parable was about. But this one is about a servant who is waiting for his master to return. And he says when the master knocks, he will immediately open the door. And this kind of brings back the, the picture illustration that Jesus gave that he says, I stand at the door and knock. And it's here in this uh, parable too that when the master knocks, the servant, and that would be us, Christ's stewards, uh, is, is ready to immediately open the door. And uh, if the master finds them watching when he comes, uh, he, will, he will wait on the servants. Isn't that interesting? He says the master will uh, prepare himself to serve, dress himself to serve, have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. See, this is part of what we're learning as God's stewards is that the master, the king, however you want to uh, think of it, God is the, the ultimate servant. We, we, what do we call the description in Isaiah 53 of Jesus? We call him the, that chapter of Isaiah we call it the description of the suffering servant. And that's what God is. He is the ultimate servant. He, he wants to save us so badly that he gives, him, he gives himself, he gives everything that he has in heaven uh, for us. And Jesus says that when the uh, master comes, he will serve the servants. And all that's necessary for that to happen is for the servants to be ready and anticipating. It doesn't mean that they had something, you know, there were things, chores they needed to do. But the main re requirement was their attitude, wasn't it? And I think this comes back to what we just talked about, of putting, seeking first the kingdom of God. If we keep first the kingdom of God, that will be our attitude towards his second coming, won't it? that it will be the thing that we are really anxious for and waiting for every day, not just the next entertainment or the next wonderful meal we can have or whatever enjoyment we can find here on this earth, but the thing we really look forward to is to seeing Christ come again. In verse 39, he says, Understand, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not let his house be broken into. You must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. The thief, he's just using as an illustration of the unexpected nature of Christ's coming. And might it be today? Well, we say... Everything that is, that is written in the book Great Controversy has not come to pass. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Things are so in such an upheave, up, condition of upheaval in the world today that I think Christ could come at any time. Uh, and being ready is a, is a privilege in that situation, isn't it? It's not a, a job we have to do to be sure we get saved. It's a wonder, it, there's something, there's expectation, isn't there? I hate to use this illustration, but when my son was younger in his teens, he had, there were certain musical groups that he liked to listen to, which I thought were terrible, and I probably looking back think they're not all that terrible they're just unimportant and inconsequential <laughs> and, and, but still uh, and I don't even remember what musical group it was but I took him to a concert and the attitude 
before the performers came on the stage is what I'm talking about. A feeling of anticipation was in this room and everyone was yelling and clapping and carrying on. They were excited. And this is really what we're talking about with our attitude to looking forward to the coming of Jesus. The Lord says in verse 42, who, th who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food? Uh, it will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns and he puts him in charge of everything. And uh, verse 45, if we say, well, it's going to be a long time before Christ comes, what is our attitude towards meeting Christ? It's not as good as it should be, isn't it? If we're just saying, well, he may come someday, but I've got a lot of other things to do in the meantime. And he says in verse 46, actually the one who doesn't expect the master to come soon will be listed among the unbelievers. So th this idea of, of anticipation, I think, is important to develop in our thinking about the coming of Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 11.10, this is the, the last text I want to read under this section. Uh, Hebrews 11.10, uh, talking about Abraham, uh, it says, I'm going to have to look at my clock here because that clock back there is not correct. So uh, to be sure we don't run over. Uh, looking for the return of Jesus. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And Abraham, you recall, was asked to leave his country, leave his home, go somewhere in the indefinite. God didn't really tell him exactly where he was going. He says, just go till I tell you to stop. And he ended up in Canaan. But even there, Abraham lived in a tent. It was a very uh, uh, non-permanent uh, situation. And in Hebrews 11.10, it says that Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect, the builder of those foundations, is God. And what would the foundations of the city that we're looking for be? All those characteristics, isn't it, of, of what God is like that we incorporate into our, into our lives. Paul says, your body is what? The temple of God. And as we develop our relationship with God, uh, Jesus is the one who builds the foundations of that temple within us. It's not something we can really do ourselves. Jesus does it within and for us. And it's a wonderful privilege, of course. Use time wisely. James 4.14 says, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, your life is like a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. When the sun comes out, the mist goes away. And that's just to emphasize that our lives here on this earth as stewards, as servants of God, seem very temporary and transient. And as such, we need to get busy and get done what needs to be done, don't we? Uh, we don't have time to waste. We don't have time to spend idly watching mindless entertainment on television and on the internet, reading mindless entertainment in books and magazines, or even spending our time, as many people nowadays are wont to do, 
looking at the news. Because all of that is temporary. And when you look at the news, you don't know exactly if what you're hearing is correct anyway. Uh, and it's all temporary. We need to be spending our time wisely. Psalm 90.12 says, Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And again, what we're really talking about is not a heart, it's our mind. Well, our time is up. This is our drill for uh, an emergency situation. So I, the plan is for everyone to get up and find your nearest exit and exit out there and wait for uh, probably five minutes until you hear that horn go twice, okay? So if, if someone was loose in here with a gun or there was a, there was a fire or something that we had to leave, that's the, that's the uh, plan. Probably for most of us, the closest is right out the front door of the church. They're not moving very fast. <laughs> if there was a shooter in here, some of us would be already dead. <laughs> 